Welcome back, networking enthusiasts. Today we'll delve into a special type of network configuration used in load balancing called DSR that stands for Direct Server Return. It's a concept that can greatly improve networking performance and response times. I will show you how it works, what issues it solves, and how to set it up using NF tables. My name is Philip. Let's get started. In the conventional load balancing model, we typically have several backend nodes connected to the same networking segment with the load balancer positioned in the front. The load balancer typically features at least two network interfaces, one linked to the backend network and another exposing the virtual IP connected to the frontend network. A client situated on the frontend network communicates with the VIP to access services. The client transmits its traffic to the load balancer through the frontend network. Subsequently, the balancer forwards the traffic to backend nodes via the backend network, following the specified load balancing policy round robin, list connections, list response time, IP hash, and so on. Of course, this diagram is simplified as the client doesn't have to be directly connected to the balancer. There can be multiple layer three hops in between. The same goes for the backend. Nodes don't have to be directly connected to the balancer. There may be multiple hops on the way. Moreover, it's common for the backend IP of the balancer to be in fact a pool of IPs and not a single IP as a single IP can only allocate over 64,000 ports. And if there is a heavy traffic, you may simply run out of ports. The diagram may be oversimplified, but it illustrates a few important concepts. First one is the backend nodes and the client nodes are on different network segments. When the client initiates the traffic, it first passes through the balancer. Upon receiving such packet, if the balancer is acting as a proxy, then it establishes a new connection to the backend node and the node sends a reply back to the balancer since the connection was initiated by the balancer and the reply goes to the client. Important thing to notice, there are two separate connections, one from the client to the balancer and another one from the balancer to the backend server. Now, in the network translation mode, when the balancer gets the packet, the destination IP gets updated to the node IP and the packet is directed to the backend node. When the backend node attempts to reply, it faces a challenge. It needs to reply to the same IP the traffic originated from, that's the client IP. So the reply is sent to its default gateway and not to the balancer. This default gateway in turn may either drop the reply or forward it to the client that will drop it anyway. Such connection won't function as expected. The destination IP to which the client is sending traffic is the load balancer's IP, and it doesn't align with the source IP from which the return traffic originates. That's the default gateway IP. What actually happens in the network translation mode is the balancer not only updates the destination IP with the node's IP, but also updates the source IP with its own IP. So, the return packet from the backend node knows to get back via the balancer. Long story short, because client node and the backend nodes are on different networks, with a load balancer in between, some form of network translation or proxying needs to happen, so the return traffic goes back via the balancer. Because of the NAT or proxying, the backend nodes no longer have the source IP the request came from. From the backend node perspective, all requests are coming from the balancer. It knows nothing about the client IP. This is only partially true, as in HTTP, you usually uh, get the source IP of the client inside the X forwarded for or forwarded headers. What if your application is not HTTP and you still require the client source IP for security and access control with the application or login and auditing purposes, geolocation, session persistence, 
legal compliance or any other custom application functionality. There's a special networking configuration called direct uh, server return, also known as direct routing, where the responses from the backend servers go directly to the client, bypassing the load balancer and traveling back to clients through the server default gateway. You will say, for the connection to be established, the client needs to see the traffic coming from the balancer IP and not from the gateway IP. I did request the connection to the balancer IP, so the reply needs to come from the balancer IP. That's true. But what if we could assign the same IP on all the backend nodes and also the balancer? I know, it sounds confusing, but stay with me. Let's try to set it up. There are multiple ways to do it. One being AJ proxy, another is EPVS. We'll use NF tables. First, let's describe our networking architecture. We have two networks, the client network, that's 192.168.10/24, and server network, that's 192.168.12/24. In the middle, there is a router that connects both networks. On the left, we have a node with 192.168.10.231 IP, that's our client, that will initiate the traffic. On the server network, we have two nodes serving HTTP traffic on port 8080 TCP. Server 1 has 12.231 IP, server 2 has 12.232 IP. On the server network, we also have a load balancer with 12.230 IP. Mind that both the balancer and backend servers are in the same networking segment. They have full layer 2 reachability. First thing that we uh, need to do in order to set up DSR balancing is create a virtual IP and assign it to our balancer. Client will use that IP to call the service. Let's go to our load balancer and open the network configuration. I will add a secondary IP, uh, 192.168.12.229. Let's save and reload the configuration. Now let's check if the secondary IP has been added. Okay, it's there. Uh, now let's assign the same virtual IP to server 1. I will not add the IP to the primary ETH interface, but to the loopback. Uh, I will tell you why in a second. Let's open the network configuration on server 1 and add the virtual IP to the loopback. Let's Save and reload the configuration. Now, check if the IP got added. Okay, it's there. Let me repeat the same steps for server 2. I will open the network configuration, add the virtual IP to the loopback, uh, save and reload the configuration, and check if the IP got added. Okay. It's there. If we look at our networking diagram, we have a new VIP assigned to both the backend servers and the load balancer. Let's start a traffic capture on the balancer for ARP request for our VIP. Let's start the same capture on server 1 and server 2. I will also start the HTTP service on port 8080 on both servers. Finally, let's try calling the service from the client machine using the virtual IP. It worked. No, not so fast. If we look at the load balancer traffic dump, we see that someone asked about the MAC address of the virtual IP address and the balancer replied, that's me. I have this IP assigned and this is the MAC address. If we look at the server one traffic dump, there's a similar story. It claimed that it has the 12.229 IP assigned, and that's the MAC address. Lastly, Server 2 also did reply with yet another MAC address. The firewall that's in between the networks did receive three different MAC addresses for the same IP. Wait, that's not right. We should have only one MAC address for our virtual IP. That should be the MAC address of the balancer. To resolve that, 
let's go to our server one and set the ARP ignore parameter for ETH0 interface to one. What it will do is ETH0 will respond only to ARP requests for local IP addresses that are configured on the same interface as the incoming request. In other words, if someone asks about 10.2.9 IP and the request is coming via ETH0, such requests will be ignored. This parameter allows ETH0 to reply only about its own MAC address, not MAC addresses of other interfaces. Another recommended option is ARP announce set to two. What it will do is, mm, when making an ARP request sent through ETH0, it will always use an address that is configured on ETH0 as the source address of the ARP request. In other words, we won't advertise the virtual IP MAC address. Let's uh, restart the traffic capture and uh, perform the same steps on server two. Now, let's restart the capture here as well. Now let's try calling the service again. The connection failed. If we look at the traffic dump on the load balancer, it did reply that it has the virtual IP assigned and did provide the MAC address. If we look at server one and server two, we see those nodes were asked about the virtual IP, but because the virtual IPs on those servers is not on the ETH0 interface, but on the loopback, the ARP ignore parameter prevented them from replying. Fantastic. That's what we wanted to achieve. Finally, let's go to our load balancer and create a new NFTables configuration file. First, let's clear the configuration with flash rule set. Then let's create a new table of net dev type. This is a special family that allows you to use the ingress hook. Now let's create a chain and name it ingress and attach to the ingress hook. Mind that unlike other hooks, ingress is attached to a particular network interface. In our case, it will be ETH0. It is very early in the packet journey. We have not even reached pre-routing. What we want to achieve is to match the destination IP address to 192.168.12.229. That's our virtual IP match the destination port to 8080 TCP, then set the source MAC address of the packet to our own MAC address. Then set the destination MAC address to a map. Key with ID zero will be the MAC address of server one. Key with ID one will be the MAC address of server two. Now we need to make the decision which key to choose based on a hash value of source IP and source port combination. By implementing this, we ensure that requests coming from the same source IP and source port will consistently be routed to the same backend server. Finally, let's forward the packets back via ETH0. Okay, let's save the configuration and reload it. Now let's go to our client and run the request a few times. We are directed to different backend servers based on the ephemeral source port. However, it's always the same backend server for the same connection to make the TCP work. When we check the server logs, we can observe that the client source IP address is being recorded. Another benefit is massive performance increase. The return packets from the backend nodes no longer go to the balancer, but are sent back directly to the client. Hence the name direct server return. On top of that, there is also a great decrease in response latency. Moreover, in DSR mode, there is much less load on the balancer. It only mangles the requests packets. Return traffic, where the packets are usually larger, skips the balancer. Also, the load balancer does not have to keep any state. It balances based on source IP or source IP and port hash, making the connection sticky. Of course, 
adding more servers will break the connection, something to keep in mind. Let's see how it looks on the diagram. First, the client creates a packet with source IP being the client IP, destination IP being the virtual IP, source MAC being the client MAC, and destination MAC being the router MAC. Then the packet goes to the router, where the source and destination IP stay the same, but the source MAC is updated to router MAC and destination MAC is updated to load balancer MAC. Then the packet is forwarded to the load balancer. Here the source and destination IP still stay the same, but the source MAC is set to the load balancer MAC and destination MAC is chosen from a map based on a hash from the source IP and source port. Let's say that server 1 is the target. Then the packet goes to server 1 backend node. Finally, the backend node will send a reply. It will set the source IP as the virtual IP, destination IP will be the client IP, source MAC will be server 1 MAC, and destination MAC will be the router. Packet will then go to the router. Mind, it did not go back to the balancer, but was sent directly to the router. Here, the source MAC is updated to the router MAC, destination MAC is updated to the client MAC, and the packet goes back to the client. Of course, DSR balancing also has its drawbacks. You cannot perform port translation, insert a cookie, nor alter the header on the balancer. Backend server must not reply to ARP request for virtual IP as it would steal the traffic from the balancer. But they still need to respond to health checks on the real IP. Also, your server needs to be in the same network segment as the balancer, unless you do IP-IP tunneling that adds yet another layer of complexity. In general, DSR introduces some deployments and design challenges, as well as additional security considerations due to asymmetrical routing. However, if designed right, it can greatly improve performance and decrease latency. In one of the future videos, I'd like to show you how to set up DSR with EPVS in Kubernetes, so please stay tuned.